No, no, oh, oh, this side, all right. I could, I could do it, really. Well, this will be interesting. How many people think that Craig won't wind up tripping over the piece of musical equipment behind me? Oh, you know me well. Good morning, welcome to Wellspring Bible Fellowship. All of you gathered here in the morning and also all of those of you joining us out there on video land, welcome to our ministry. Uh, so we are going to be in 1 John, the book of 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but the book of 1 John. We're going to be in what? 1 John. Okay, good. All right. Interaction. I love it. So we're going to be uh, tra- trucking right along. Last week, we came through uh, a, a plethora of verses. We covered how many? Four. Four verses, right, in, in a whole sermon. I never was known for necessarily going through the word quickly, but, you know, maybe today we'll get through something like, I don't six. <laughs> I know, right? Set your goals high. So real quick, here's a freebie. Uh, if you got your Bibles open to 1 John chapter 1, uh, again, if you're watching from home, this is kind of a freebie, uh, but chapter 1, verse 1, John is kind of setting up a precedence here. He, we got to know a little bit about the Apostle John. We talked a little bit about his calling into ministry, how Jesus called him, said, follow me, and about his passion to follow the Lord and the, and the way that he lived his life, fervently to follow the Lord, giving up everything that was important to him in in the moment that he was asked to call and then engaging the rest of his life to follow the Lord. In John 1, 1, John writes, what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The two points I want to make out of this are, again, the same points that John made then that we discussed last week. First of all, that The message of the gospel always has been. Jesus always has been. He was with the Father in the beginning. The other thing that we get here is John says, and concerning that word, Jesus, Jesus is real. And I I had to make this point last week, and we need to make it again this week because it ties into the, the message that John is going to get into, kind of the purpose for writing this letter. But none of this matters if Jesus is an abstract thought. Jesus is real. John says, we walked with him, we talked with him, we touched him and he touched us. He's real. It's not a concept. It's not a thought. Jesus is. He's just as real as you or I, and certainly more important in the the totality of circumstances than you or I, because we're talking about he who was there with the creator of all things at the creation of all things. He who always has been and always will be. He who is the author of our salvation. So I may have some concerns about my own sense of importance, but certainly I need to be focusing more on Jesus. And this is what John was saying. He said, guys, look, as I come to you regarding your walk with the Lord, and he's going to be talking today about some people that say, oh, well, I follow Jesus. And he's going to say, really? Well, let's take a look at that walk. And he's going to tell them, that doesn't look much like Jesus. So the, again, the, the, the importance of this is to say that Jesus is real, that, that that changes us. In chapter 1, verse 3, John said, what we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us. Indeed, our fellowship is with the Father, with the Son, with, with, uh, with Son Jesus Christ. He said it's so important that in the Holy Spirit, when we accept Jesus as our Savior, and we say, Lord, please wash this sin out of my life, and Lord, help me to follow you, the Lord says, fine, I'm going to help you do that. I'm sure and I'm faithful to do that. And he says, you don't have to do it alone. Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm going to send a helper to come after me, one who is just like me, the very substance of me, but rather than walking with you, the Spirit of God is going to walk in you. So, I mean, there's nowhere I can go where I don't have the helper with me. And that gives me fellowship. It gives me fellowship horizontally with all the other believers that we walk and we encounter with. And it gives me fellowship with the Son and fellowship with the Father. I cannot have that fellowship with the Holy, without the Holy Spirit. And that's the point he wanted to say. We talked about that verse in John chapter 10, 10. The Lord said, Jesus said, we asked, why did Jesus come? Well, the Lord answered this in John 10, 10. He said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That was the whole purpose is so that we would live and not just live in the flesh, but live eternal lives that we would be saved from the condemnation of death that comes with the sin that we brought into this relationship and that we would have life more abundantly, not just getting through, kicking rocks from the day that we're born to the day we die, but that we would live abundantly and have joy in doing so. Okay, that was all last week. Again, that was a freebie. Uh, now let's get on with the passages for today. No, we still got time. Uh, this is going to work. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This is the message 
that we have heard from him and announced to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. What a great way to start. I mean, we could pretty much camp right there. God is light. Now he starts off with, again, the idea that the message that he's sending out to you, the message he sent to the, to the hearers of the word in its day, was that this message is a message from God. Christ gave this message to me, I'm giving it to you. That's what John was saying. We now have this really cool thing. We call it the Bible. This is kind of cool. You got one of these things? If you don't, you should really get one. They're really neat. Because it is the encompassed word of God. It is a how to live your life. It is a how to have your sins forgiven. It is a how to roadmap to heaven. It teaches us everything that God has been doing. It teaches us what God is doing now. It teaches us what God is going to do in the future. This is a really cool book. You should get one. If you have one, raise it up. Let me see them. You've got one at home. I see a lot of e-readers going up there. It's like an old rock concert now, except instead of lighters, now we've got got our eye devices and our electronic devices. Well, that's cool as we talk about all those lights out there because... This is the idea that he's saying, look, we need to share this message that has gone on and gone on around us. Remember, this was the last instruction that Jesus gave to the disciples. If you look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20, I'm going to read it. You probably know these. This is the authority that that Jesus gave to his disciples. Jesus in Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20 said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you. Now, for those of you who have been going to church for more than about a week, you've probably heard this passage. In churchy terms, we call this the Great Commission. Jesus went to his disciples just before he ascended into heaven. And he said, look, guys, all authority has been given to me. I am the ultimate authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. It wasn't a request. It wasn't a, therefore, if you feel like it today, go and share the word with somebody. It was a command. Go, therefore, and share this message. Share it with all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I command you. So it wasn't just go and share the gospel, but it was go and teach people the things that you have learned. Now, I don't care whether you've been going to church for a week or a month of weeks or a year of weeks. God is teaching you things, and you have something that you can share with the world around you. I get people sometimes, they come to me and go, well, Craig, you've been studying the Bible for a long time, and and you go up and you teach and you present God's word, so you're equipped to do that. And they feel that they are not. I'm sorry, but that is just not true. Every single one of us has received something from the Lord that we can share with somebody else, and you can share it in a way that is unique and distinct to you that I can't share it. You can reach people in your circle of influence that I can't reach. I have a circle of influence I can reach. 15 years as a patrol officer sitting in the back seat of my car, you are a captive audience. I could reach you. <laughs> but each one of us has a circle of influence that we have contact with, that we have fellowship with, we have relationship with, that you can spark up conversations with that person and share with them the truth, the words of life that only you can get through to that person. So this commission was not only to those disciples standing on the hill that day. It wasn't only to those men that would be called to be pastors someday or to those women that would lead the children's church and women's ministries. It was to everybody. He said, go therefore, y'all. The point that John wants us to get though, again, is we need to be sharing this with the world around us. Now, before John begins the next section, because when he gets into the next section, there's going to be some, there's going to, there's some people who are going to be uncomfortable with the teaching that John get into here. So he wants to make this precedence. He said, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. Well, what does that mean, God is light? Well, it means God is love. It means there is no resentment in him at all. It means God is good. There is no evil in God at all. It means God is righteous. There is no sin in God at all. He is all light. And that's a concept that we're trying to get our heads around. It's like, okay, what is all light? Because don't light and darkness always go side by side? I mean, aren't they connected in some way? But John says God is all light. Now, we get the idea of light and dark. I mean, all, all of us grew up watching TV. There's none of us here that I don't think are that uh, seasoned of saint that we haven't had an opportunity to watch TV. You remember the old cowboy shows? 
Okay, the old cowboy shows. So the bad guy would come riding into town, right? He'd have on his hat, and his hat was what color? Black, because he was the bad guy, right? And then out would come the sheriff. Ching, ching. And what color was his hat? Because light represents good. See, we got this concept when we were kids. This is nothing new. Throughout all the time, we see this concept that darkness represents evil and light represents good. And this was the same that we find in our scriptures as well. The word in Greek for light is theos. It represents good, righteousness, uh, holiness, truthfulness. And when we see the word skotia, darkness, it represents sin, evil, rebellion, or lies. And so when he says God is light, he's saying God is good. But he doesn't say God is just, I mean, that he's partial light or sort of light or kind of light. What does he say here? He says, no, he says God is light. There is no darkness in God at all. None at all. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17. Oh, look, there's jump verses up there again. Hebrews 6.17. The writer of Hebrews is talking about the promises that God had made to Abraham. He'd made two promises to Abraham back in the Old Testament as we refer to it. He told Abraham, surely I will bless you. And he said, surely I will multiply you. In verse 17, the writer says, in the same way, God, desiring even more to show to the heirs of the promise the unchangeableness of his purpose. The unchangeableness of God's purpose. Our God does not change. He is the same now as he always was and the same he always will be. He has the same purpose. And he made this, this purpose, he interposed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things, God made promises, those two unchangeable things. He makes this next important statement. It is impossible for God to lie. There are many things that God can do, but God will not, cannot lie. God is all light. He is all truth. We who have taken refuge would have strong encouragement to take hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil. How many here have ever felt your boat in life drifting down rocky waters, stormy seas, and thought to yourself, I'm in danger here, and sure could could use an anchor to steady this calm or calm this storm around me. He says here that the hope that we have in the Lord is an anchor of the soul. God has promised to prosper you. He has prospered to protect you eternally. Doesn't mean that the walk is going to be easy. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have rapids in the rivers of life. Doesn't mean you're not going to know stormy seasons. But what it does mean is that your eternity has been secured if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And that's an anchor to my soul, that I can weather the storms of life knowing that a safe port has been promised to me by a God who cannot lie. And that's an anchor for my soul. And that hope goes beyond the veil. Jesus now having ascended to the right hand of the Father, him him who died to make this promise possible for me that my sins be forgiven, now resides at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us. What a cool place for him to be. Because he has called us as the children of God and says, you are mine. And now he's standing at the right hand of the Father going, yep, that one's mine. That's a cool place for my Savior to be. Turn with me to Numbers 23, 19. Well, we're going to flip back and forth. We're going to be all over this book. Numbers 23, 19. The prophet Balaam talking to Balak. Balak kept trying to get the prophet Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. And he just couldn't do it. God just wouldn't allow him to curse the nation of Israel as much as he might have wanted to do so. In verse, uh, chapter 23, verse 19, Balaam says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said and will he not do it? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? Balaam's point, the prophet, he says he understood this about God. He said, God does not lie. God is truthful. God is not wicked. Man is wicked. You want to be let down, follow man. You want to have promises that you can follow and trust in, follow God. 
Man has done plenty of wrong things that we need to turn away from. God has done nothing that he needs to repent from, that he needs to turn away from. God is trustworthy and God is true. So God is light. So God is, is good. I get that. But what about us? Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Told you we're going to be all over this thing. Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to be picking up in verse 8. I'm going to read verse 8 and verse 10. Ephesians 5, 8 and verse 10. Scripture says this in Ephesians 5, 8, For you formerly, you were formerly darkness. For we were formerly darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. Verse 10 says, Trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. I was once darkness. I was once sin. I was once resentful. I was once evil. I was once consumed by my sin, but the scripture says, now I am a child of light. Now, for all those people from Myrtle Creek that are up here now and knew me as a child, I've had a couple of them drift up here, and they see what I do for God now, and they give me this look. I have not always been a child of light. I'm just saying. I know, I know probably most of you were, but I wasn't that guy. And so I look at this verse, it says, you were once darkness, and I go, yes, yes, I was. <laughs> I know what I did. And yet the Bible says, God's word, God says to me, now you are a child of light, live as a child of light, and find out what pleases God. Herein now becomes my new mission in life. Find out what makes God happy. You lived a long life trying to figure out what made you happy, and we called that walking in darkness and walking in sin. Now the Lord says, but you're now a child of light. Find out what makes me happy and walk in that way. Well, how in the world did that happen? How did I go from being a child of darkness to being a child of light? And the people from South County still haven't figured it out. I'm not sure that I have. Because it was a long walk. It wasn't like a simple turn. Go with me to 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Yes, I am from South County, yes. That's why I can, I can talk about South County all I want. I are one. Here's the thing. See if this describes you maybe just a little bit in some way. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Here's a sobering thought. Scripture says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Any questions? I mean, there's a whole world out there that is really confused about that paragraph, that sentence right there. Let me be clear. God's word is clear. Verse 11, such were some of you. Amen? But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. It's not because of anything I did. It's not the bath that I took. It's what he did on that cross. I didn't make myself light. There's nothing that I could do to turn on God's light in me. I couldn't power that light. I couldn't fuel that light. I couldn't even find that light. But Jesus is the light of the world. He said so of himself. And the spirit is light. God is good. God is light. And so when we accept the Lord and the, and the Spirit of God comes into us, we who have believed and received Jesus as our Savior, then the Spirit of God who is goodness and who is light comes into us. Therefore, it's not me who is shining. 
It's not I who am the, the, that child of light in and of myself. It is the spirit of God shining out of me because I know what I am fully capable of, of apart from the spirit of God. But with the spirit of God, all of itself, I see me doing and behaving and acting in a way that is totally apart from what my flesh wants me to do because now I'm walking in the spirit. Turn with me to Galatians 2.20. If you're breaking through some new creases in your Bible, that's a good thing. If they're flipping like cloth, that's a better thing. Galatians 2.20. Paul says to the church in Galatia, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith, in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. It's no longer about me. It quit being about me and it quit being about my life of darkness the moment that I said, Jesus, take the wheel. When I said, Jesus, I know that you are. I believe this in my heart that you are and that you died on the cross for my sin. And I accept that, that payment for my sin. Jesus, forgive me my sin and help me to repent from it and turn away from it and follow you the rest of my life. When I do that, I'm now living my life, or I ought to be doing it in such a way as to bring pleasure to my Lord in a way that looks like the way that my Lord walked. That's following after him. That's Ephesians 5, 8, and 10, where he said, live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. Because if my walk doesn't look like Jesus, then how is the world around, around me supposed to know who I'm following? If I walk in such a way that I look like the darkness around me, then all the world is going to see is the darkness around me. What happens to my testimony? I lose it. I can say all the flowery words up here that, I, that you want, possibly could want to hear, but if my walk in life doesn't reflect that also, then it loses all of its authority. 1 John 1, 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Here's something kind of cool. 1 John 1, 5 says God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. John 1, 5 says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. How cool is that? All you got to remember is John 1, 5. It's either 1 John 1, 5 or John 1, 5. Either way, there's a cool lesson there. I love it when God does stuff like this. The light shines in the darkness and darkness did not comprehend it. Jesus is the light. Jesus came into a dark world to bring light into the world to illuminate how sinful they were and to bring a solution to it. And the world around him in his day did not receive it. They didn't comprehend it. They didn't get it. It was confusing to them. It was overwhelming to them. In fact, they rebelled against it. Well, guess what? Nothing has really changed. Jesus is still calling out to the world around us, saying, look at your sin. Look at the problems that you have. But the good news is I have a solution for it if you'll accept it, if you'll believe it. And the world around us is still pushing back. And day by day, as I look at our headlines, I see a world that is pushing back harder and harder. The flesh of the world is pushing back so hard against the Spirit of God because it is so intimidated by the Spirit of God. Do you get it? Okay, so that's us but not God. Again, chapter 1, 5, this is the message we heard from him, John says, and I announce it to you, John says, that God is light, and him there is no darkness at all. No God that is, he, God is all light. There is no darkness in him at all. Not even the slightest little bit. Nothing. It's all good. In God, it's all good stuff. Not a single bit of bad in God. People go, you know, well, maybe God is, uh, maybe, maybe he's got his little evil intention here, or maybe a little bad here. No, God is all good. I got an example. Who here likes brownies? Anybody here not like brownies? I mean, I've got a couple brownie lovers. If you love brownies, let me see a hand. Okay, we've we got some brownie lovers up there. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about goodness. How good does it have to be to really be good? So, you know, you make up a batch of brownies, and, you know, if you want to make good brownies, you, you put in good ingredients, right? So, 
decided to you know, make up some brownies, so you're going to want to put up the good ingredients. And so you, you go out there and you get yourself some, some local butter and you get yourself some good chocolate. You got a good friend that brings you down some farm fresh eggs. You put that all together. I'm whipping that up in there. Whew, it smells good, doesn't it? Can you smell it? Can, can't you? You're in the back row and you can smell it. Whew. It's good. I mean, all good ingredients, everything in there is the best it could possibly be. In fact, yesterday was a beautiful day. It was a good day. Anybody get outside yesterday and enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, I got, you know what? In fact, I was turning out, I thought, you know, I'm just going out there. I'm going to go enjoy some of that day outside too. I went out there I'm looking at it. It was a beautiful day. Flowers bloom. My, my, my ornamental trees are blooming. I'm here looking at one of my ornamental trees. Now, the corner of my eye, I saw something drop out of the sky. Now, look, and this big old blue jay flew over and landed in this tree. Anybody want a brownie? <laughs> what? It's mostly good. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, how much, how much bad is there really in each one? I mean, it's got to be just the tiniest little bit. No one? You'll take one. <laughs> So what do you think, good enough or gross? Gross, that's yeah, gross, okay? And, and then that's the point. I mean, just the tiniest little bit of bad is gross. Just the least, least little bit. And we think, you know, and that's the thing, when we judge by our standards, we, we think to ourselves, you know, well, it's, maybe it's good enough. I mean, it's only a little bit of bad. But God says, no, that's gross. There is nothing gross in God. There's nothing disgusting in God. God is all light. God is all good. There's not the least little bit of bad in God. That's why the psalmist in 136.1 can say this, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. God is good. It's not just that, you know, God is good. No, God is good all the time, every day. And our response to this is to go out and live a life that, that should imitate, should look like our good God. One of the ways that we do this is that we live out our good works. Another one is we share the good word, and we should have a good walk. Our word and our walk should, should at, some, at least <laughs> resemble each other. But now John's going to get into the heart of this thing, because he's going to start talking to us about some problems. See, not everybody, not everybody is, is walking that good. Some say that they are, and this is the point that John wants to make. He's talking to people who have claimed to be followers of the Lord. Now, he's going to bring out seven of these. We're going to talk about three of them today. Call them stinking thinkings. That was a Ronism from back in the day. But I agree with it. These people think that they're doing the right thing, but the question is, are they really? Join me in uh, 1 John chapter 1, verses 6 through 7. John says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Again, not everybody's walking the good walk. Some of them are stumbling the bad stumble. So here's the problem. John says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in the darkness, the reality is we lie and we do not practice the truth. I'm sorry, what's another word for lie? If, if you lie, we might call you a, a liar, liar, pants on fire. Much to the chagrin of our Lord, because this is a person who says, they said of themselves, well, I have fellowship with Jesus and yet I'm walking in the darkness. We live a lie and we do not practice the truth. The solution for this is, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, I want to make a point here. This does not speak to the person who is battling that battle of flesh versus, versus the spirit. And that's a very real battle. It's a very, very real battle. We have a spirit in us that is the spirit of light. 
Here's the problem. God, all-knowing and all good, took a spirit of light and put it into a body that was contaminated with sin, that had darkness in it, and not just a little bit. And so the minute that he dropped a good spirit into a sinful flesh, a conflict arose. Now the victory, of course, is to our Lord, but the day-to-day walk is, is a battle. Day by day, hour by hour, it's a battle as the Spirit of God wages war with our flesh. Turn with me to Galatians 5.16. Galatians 5.16. Scripture says, but I say, walking by the Spirit... Walk, rather, by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. If I were to just simply follow the Spirit's desire for me, the Spirit's will for me all the time, this wouldn't be a problem. The problem is I'm still me, and I still have this fleshly shell that I'm walking in. He says, but if I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh, for the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, for these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. War right where you're sitting. The Spirit of God in you, fighting it out with the flesh that is around it. And the purpose of this, he says, is so that we may not do the things that we please. If you leave it up to me, I'm going to do things that don't please God. I guarantee it. That's the flesh. If we were just to follow the Spirit all the time, it wouldn't be a problem. But we don't follow the Spirit all the time. And so this battle gets waged day after day, hour after hour. And they are in opposition to one another. They are two opposing forces. One says, honor God. The other one says, well, let's honor me. One says, do it things that please the Lord. The other one says, I'm more interested in doing the things that please me. One says, be as a spirit of uh, uh, a child, child of the light and seek the things that please the Lord, that Ephesians passage. The other one says, yeah, but this is what I want. Well, there's the problem is that we tend to have a vision problem every time we put I into the sentence because I don't tend to desire the things that God wants if I'm not listening to the spirit. Turn with me to Romans chapter seven. I love, love, love this passage. Romans 7.15. Romans chapter 7, verse, uh, verses 15 through 25. It's a long section, but I... <laughs> I identify with this passage. Maybe you do too. This is the Apostle Paul speaking, the guy that wrote the better share of the New Testament, a guy that walked with the Lord, a guy that knew sin and knew the desire to serve the Lord. And here's his take on this. Paul says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. Amen. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin, which dwells in me. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members, wretched man that I am. Who will set me free from this body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord then, who on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Paul says, oh, this is frustrating. I am trying so hard to follow God. 
And yet in my flesh, I keep doing the things I know I'm not supposed to do. Gah! It's frustrating. And Paul's lament, he finishes off that lament with this idea. He says, who will save me from this? From this constant battle between the spirit and the flesh, who will save me from this? He says, thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So, when we get to this passage in John, understand that when John says here in 1 John 1, 6 and 7, uh, I'm sorry, 1, 8 and 9, nope, 6 and 7, there we go. He says, if we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Now, he's talking not about the person, though, and the reason I bring all that out is I'm not telling you that you're walking in darkness because you have sin. It's a day-by-day battle. It's a day-by-day battle where some days we have victories and some days we suffer defeat. And that's why I need a Savior every day. That's why it's not a one-time event where I go, well, thank goodness that Jesus saved me and now I'm done. It's a day-by-day thing. But what he does talk to here is the person who says that they are following the Lord and yet they choose to walk in darkness. This is a decision that they have made to walk dark paths, to walk in the paths of unrighteousness, claiming to follow the Lord, but then intentionally walking off and going on different paths. You cannot walk two paths at the same time. Try it sometime. It's horribly confusing. You've got one foot on either side of the path. That's okay. You can do that for a while, but at some point, those paths are going to go two different directions. You can only do that for so long, and you're going to have to make a choice to follow the Lord or to follow the flesh. You cannot walk two paths at the same time. For the sake of time, I'm going to read this for you. This is Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. What a scary verse. What a scary verse that there are people out there, Jesus said in his day, and they're out there in our day too, that are going around claiming, oh yeah, I follow Jesus. And on that day of judgment, Jesus is going to go, I have no idea who you are. I call it the difference between a head knowledge and a heart knowledge. Maybe you know Jesus in your head, but have you believed and received him in your heart? There are many that say, I know about Jesus. Well, that's great. Satan and the demons know about Jesus but have we trusted Jesus in our heart? Matthew Henry gave us this quote. Matthew said, Christ here shows us that it will, excuse me, Christ here shows that it will not be enough to own him for for our master, only in word and tongue. It is necessary to our happiness that we believe in Christ, that we repent of sin, that we live a holy life, and that we love one another. This is his will, even our sanctification. Old theologian, but a great concept. It's not enough just to say that we follow Jesus in word and tongue, but we have to actually follow that out and actually repent of our sin and actually live a holy life. That's what he wants for us to do. That's only one of the three. We've got two more to go. Concept number two, chapter one, verses eight and nine. John says, if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's the problem. If I say that I have no sin. Now, he's going to talk here in point number three about a different concept. This person is not saying that I have not sinned. They're saying I have sinned, but they're saying I have no sin. What are you saying, Craig? Well, here's what I'm saying. This person is saying that although I have sinned, I'm not accountable to that sin. There's a couple different ways we could look at this. Number one is to say that, well, I have no sin because the sins of my past have been forgiven. And since I choose to follow Jesus, I've committed no sin since then. This person says, yeah, I sinned, but Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And since I started following Jesus, I haven't sinned since then. And the problem with this is what? You're wrong. Just saying. And therein lies foolishness and arrogance and pride, which are the fertilizer that springs up plants of unholiness like that. We all have sinned. So that very argument does away with itself. 
John says, you're only fooling yourself. The second way to look at this is to say, well, I have no sin because I've been reborn in the spirit and the spirit cannot sin. Therefore, sin is not an issue for the spirit of God that is in me because that spirit is all light and I've been born again in the spirit. So while my spirit is eternally secure and my place in heaven is eternally secure, but I live in this broken flesh that is bound to sin. And so if I sin in the body, that's okay. Because Jesus died for my sin in the flesh. John says, you're only deceiving yourself. That is, you're only fooling yourself. I'm just, again, I'm going to read this uh, just for the sake of time. Romans 6, verses 1 through 7. Paul says, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Now, I'm not a math genius, but, but, but honestly, think about this. May we continue in sin so that grace can increase. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? If I sinned a little bit, then a little bit of grace would cover that sin. So if I sin a lot, then I get a lot of grace. That's better, right? Paul says, may it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been buried or baptized rather into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his, life, his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so too might we walk in the newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we will be like him in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with. So we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. We follow Jesus. Yes, our sin was forgiven by the Lord. So then should we continue to go on and live in sin since Jesus died for sin? Okay, if you drank a half gallon of poison and somebody came along and saved you, would you grab the jug and drink another half gallon of poison? It just doesn't make any sense. And yet Paul says that this is a, a classification of people that are saying, well, I have no sin because Jesus died for my sins. No, we still have sin and we still need the Lord. And his solution to this is that we need to confess our sins because if we confess our sins, then he's righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's jump down to uh, the third line of thinking here. This is chapter one, verses 10 through two, one through 12. This person says that if we say we have not sinned, now, here's a real interesting one. Now, the first person, the, the person before this, he said, I have no sin. I've sinned, but I'm not held accountable to it. This person says, I've never sinned. I've never done anything so bad that a loving God would cast me into hell. And, there, and the answer is, wrong. Yes, you have. Want a brownie? <laughs> it's only got a little bit of bad in it. A little bit of bad doesn't make it into heaven. That's why we need a savior and a custodian. <laughs> Here's the problem. If we say that we have not sinned, well, then we're a liar and, and foolish. The reality of it is if we say that, we make Christ a liar and his word is not in us. The solution, my children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for all those, for those of the whole world. Paul, John's going to talk more about Jesus as a propitiation in, in later chapters. But to the person that says, well, I'm a good person, I'm going to go to heaven. God says, you're not that good. What is the standard of good? I mean, I showed you the brownies. And I said, hey, the brownies are pretty good. But they were really gross because there's a component of yuck in them. Well, there's a component of yuck in us also. The standard isn't our standard of good. The standard is God is the standard of good. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we heard from him and announced to you that God is light. In him, there is no darkness. That's the standard of good. And quite frankly, we don't measure up. Romans 3, verse 22 through 24 Scripture says, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This isn't a you and a me thing. This isn't a, I'm a better than you, or I'm sort of good, and you're good, and I'm better. This, this is an all us thing. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the goodness of God. There is not one of us who is all light. In all of us, there is some darkness. 
And so we get that first out of uh, Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we have been justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which, in, which is in Christ Jesus. Not because it's something I did, but because it's something he did. If I'm going to be judged based on my standard of goodness, I'm going to fall horribly short of the standard of God's goodness. My good is not as good as God's good. Follow that. But it's God's good that is the standard for goodness. Romans 6, through 23, but now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I went and checked my file out just to see. Pretty good. What do you think? Good enough? It's pretty good. The survey says, yeah. No, the answer is it's not good enough. There's nothing I could do to make it good enough. Disobedience, dishonor, rebellion, it's all in here. It's not good enough. That's why this verse, really, when you think about it, you put it into perspective. Here's a verse that maybe you've heard of. John 3, 16, right? Heard of it? But God, right? So loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Here's the thing. I mean, yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, compared to some standards of some people, this is pretty good. But it's got bad in there. It's got gross in there. It's got yucky in there. And I'm the one that put it in there. I can't blame anybody else for that. I'm the one that put the gross in there. And you're the one that put the gross in you. And it's not good enough. So what are we going to do? Because it's a problem that I can't fix. And the truth remains the truth. And someday, here's a <laughs> newsflash, someday you're going to die. I'm if that comes as a shock, I'm, I'm sorry. Spoiler alert. And when you do, there's a judgment that's coming. There's a scale that's coming. And if you're not covered by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, then on that day, your life is going to be weighed according to your deeds. The pages of your life will be exposed to the light of God, measured up to his standard of good and I've got a problem. Because on that day, the blood red pages of your own sin will convict you. But God sent his son to die on the cross so that these sins are covered. So on that day, when our lives are judged, it's not my life that the Lord looks at. Jesus says, I took care of that. God sees us through his eyes. And he says, you are a child of light. How cool is that? If you've never accepted that message, if you've never made that personal, if you've never said, wow, I got a problem, and you want to accept Jesus as your Savior, today would be a great day to do it. Today would be a perfect opportunity to say, you know what? You know, whether you're here in the audience today or whether you're in the audience at home watching this, you can say this prayer. You can say, Jesus, I, I get it. You're real. It's not an abstract. It's not a thought. It's not a concept. I'm saying that it's, it's truth and it's light and it's, it's the message that I need to know because I know that one day my sins are going to be exposed to God's light, to, your, to the light of, of true goodness, and I know it's not good enough. I don't want to be condemned because of that. I don't want to go to that place where God is not because of that. But Jesus, I accept that you came in the flesh, the light of the world, and died on the cross for my sin. You died on the cross so that the consequence of my sin, the yuck that I put into my life, would be covered, would be forgiven. That we are redeemed, bought with your blood. Jesus, I get that. And from this day forward, I... I, I got to choose a path. I can't walk two paths. I got to choose a path. 
And one of these paths leads to heaven and leads to forgiveness and leads to a place that is a place of rest and goodness. And the other place leads to a place where God's blessing is not and of torture. Jesus, today, I choose to follow your path. You are all good. You are all light. And I am not. And that's why I need you. And I need you every day. Because every day I've got darkness that comes into my life as I fight that battle between the spirit that you've promised to give me. If I believe and trust in you, it's going to fight a hard battle with the flesh around me. Day in and day out. And Jesus, I need you to help fight that battle with me. I'm going to stumble. I'm going to fall. In pride and arrogance, I'm going to fall. In the passion of my own desire and lust, I'm going to fall. Jesus, you've promised me that I don't have a license to sin, but I'm convicted by it. I'm torn apart by it, and I want you to forgive it, and and Lord, I want you to help me to walk in the way that I know I ought to walk and to be a light to the world around me because of all that you have done for me. It's a long prayer, but Jesus, I, I mean it for myself, and I hope the hearers of your word accept it today. Because without you, there is no hope. You are the light of the world. We are your people. Lord, help us to follow 